Fantastic. Well, welcome to our courageous conversation. I want to welcome, first of all, everybody that is right here. Come on, make some noise. You can make some noise right now, sitting here at our Green Valley campus. And this is our courageous conversation, and we are going to be bridging the gap between law enforcement and the community. And uh, I'm so excited about this. We were talking in the back, and I just, I just, man, my heart was so full. And I said this to our church this past weekend, is that uh, we're kingdom people, and, and we have to take a kingdom perspective on things. And, um, and so that's, that's where we are. You know, I, I say this, we're not about the donkey, we're not about the elephant, we're about the lamb. Okay, and, and so let, let, what is Jesus and his kingdom and what should we be doing? And so uh, if you're new, we are having these conversations because we believe in a very diverse church, diverse in political views, diverse in e economy, diverse in ethnicity and race, that we got to stay at the table and we have to continue the conversations. And even if we don't agree, it doesn't make you my enemy. And, and, and to have that dialogue, and unfortunately, um, as one of our panelists, I'll introduce him in just a moment, said we are living in the most polarized time. And, and it's sad because when there's polarization, there can't be communication. And, and we have to be able to sit down. And, um, and as I said, there's no questions coming from the audience or even online. And um, we're just excited that you decided to join us. I know people are joining right now on our stream on Facebook and at churchlv.com. And again, for the people that are here, um, what I want to do is I want to introduce our guests. I want to read a scripture and, um, and then pray, and then we will uh, start the dialogue coming up. First of all, to my left, to your right, is Under Sheriff Kevin McMahill. As he pointed out to me, he said, I'm Kevin. And so uh, 29 years of law enforcement uh, experience. He began his career with Las Vegas Metro as a police officer. And now he is the undersheriff appointed as of November 14th. And we appreciate your service and all the men and women that are serving the Las Vegas community and uh, Metro. Yes, we, we do. And, uh, and then also to my right, to uh, your left is a friend who's becoming a better friend. And it, it's, it's funny how we knew each other in Las Vegas, but we met in D.C. Uh, for the first time. But this is John Ponder in 2004 in a small jail cell. You give him a big hand clap. He was facing a 23-year sentence in federal prison, made a determined decision that this would be the last time he would spend time incarcerated. He grew up in the streets of New York, and got involved in gangs, addicted to drugs, alcohol, arrested for the first time at the age of 12. Many years of this continued lifestyle resulted in multiple incarcerations and a general feeling of hopelessness. As a three-time convicted felon, he prayed for God's will to be done. He made a promise to God and to himself that he would change his life to transform into the man he was created and destined to be regardless of the outcome of his upcoming sentence. He was miraculously, uh, he was miraculously only given a five-year sentence. John spent his entire time in prison educating himself, learning and growing, and preparing himself for one day he would return home. And a lot of you may know this story, but he also runs, really, in the nation, the best ministry, Hope for Prisoners, that has the best <laughs> success rate of any ministry. When we were together at the White House with President Trump, and that's where I begin to hear. And if you're at Church LV, we support Hope for Prisoners. Your giving, your generosity is making a difference in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people's lives. And so John has served nearly 3,500 clients since, since its inception of his ministry and boasts a 6% rate of recidivism, which is 95% success. 94%. It's just off the charts, like I said. We're going to hear more from him. And then I got to meet uh, for the first time, Pastor Tony Loudon. In addition, <laughs> Pastor Tony. In addition to his newly appointed position as the national reentry czar 
Tony Loudon is the executive director of the Federal Interagency Council on Crime Prevention and Improving Reentry, Office of Justice Program, Department of Justice. Yes. He was raised in North Philly in a single parent home and understands the plight of poverty and illiteracy. Tony double majored in economics and government at the University of Southern California. I won't hold it against you, UCLA Bruins. While on the athletic scholarship, and earned his Master's of Divinity, come on, from New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. He has a long history of work experience and appointed that, and appointments that have made him a valuable and contributing person to our entire nation. He is married with a daughter and is currently the pastor of Maranatha Baptist Church in Plains, Georgia. He also serves as, serves as chaplain for the Secret Service in Southwest Georgia. Can we give all our esteemed guests one more big hand clap online campus? And for the sake of maybe people are, are uh, tuning in online, I am Benny Perez, and uh, I am the lead pastor, come on, of Church LV in the Las Vegas Valley. I want to read you a scripture, and this is Isaiah chapter 58, and um, the prophet is speaking, and he says, We'll begin at verse 11. The Lord will guide you continually, giving you water when you are dry and restoring your strength. You will be like a well-watered garden, like an ever-flowing spring. Some of you will rebuild the deserted ruins of your cities. Then you will know, then you will be known as a rebuilder of walls and a restorer of homes. We want to be known, come on church, as the rebuilder, come on and the restorer of homes and people's lives. We want to talk about kingdom stuff today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity we have. Thank you for, Lord, these incredible men, these esteemed guests that, Lord, uh, are gathered with us. And we gather under your name, Jesus. We lift up the banner of Jesus over our nation, over, Lord God, our cities. And Lord, as we talk about law enforcement and community and bridging that gap, I pray for open ears, open hearts. Let us rejoice, God, with, with Lord God, the things that are happening as we're seeing people's lives change through Hope for Prisoners, working with Metro, God, and all the other things that we're going to hear about. And Lord, I know there's still uh, ways to go. And I pray, God, that we would continue to, Lord, bridge that gap. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, everybody say the big amen. Amen, 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 amen. Thank you so much. Well, John, um, you know, we were in Washington, D.C., and we had the opportunity of uh, meeting with the president, uh, President uh, Trump, and it was about the uh, First Step Act, I believe, and prison reform. And it was there that uh, we started the dialogue and, and, um, and, and hearing more about you, what you were doing there uh, than, than even what I even knew here in Las Vegas. And so we wanted to have a conversation in, in full transparency. I just reached out to John. I said, John, would, would you do this with me? You know, and, and I, I want to really share what's happening. You've, you've been on uh, multiple shows, national shows, talking about uh, prison reform, recidivism rate, uh, working with police, and things have come up, you know, with police. And we were talking about the conversation last week. And I said, John, how would you answer this question? Remember that question that I would tell you about? Yes. Can you jump in there and kind of just start that? Because it was a brilliant answer. Oh, absolutely. Um, I, was, I was having a, uh, a conversation with a national radio station about the work that we do with the law enforcement and uh, the national attention that we've gotten. And just really excited about the conversations that we're having right now because of the work that we are doing together. And it is so important because you look at what's happening in communities across the country where there's a disconnect between law enforcement and communities. This is why these issues are so very, very important. Um, and um, with Selen worked very closely with law enforcement and some of my best friends on the planet uh, are law enforcement. Like who would have thunk 15, 20 years ago, I'd be sitting on a platform saying that some of my best friends today are men and women from law enforcement. And as this, uh, uh, this, this host was giving me pushback 
on uh, bad police officers and uh, defund the police and, and all these different things, whatever you're talking across the country. I have to stop in the middle of it because I started taking personal, right? Because I work very closely with law enforcement. And, and, and in the conversation, I, I stopped him and I asked him, I said, you know, let me ask you a question. Are you married? And he said, yes, I, I'm married. And I said, well, I'm pretty sure that you're a good husband. I said, you know, I'm married too. And I try to be the best, absolute best husband I can be. And there are a lot of husbands out there that I know that are really good husbands that take care of their wives and, and love on their wife and they, they don't abuse their wives. But then I said, there are some men out there that are abusive to their wives. Some men that beat their wives and some men don't take care of the wife. I said, please don't lump me in with them. And that's the same thing when we're talking about police officers, right? That there are some really, really good, and I kind of took it personal because I work hand in hand with law enforcement. And I see the men and women from law enforcement with their boots on the ground that are going above and behind the call of duty and a really, really good uh, a police officer. And it breaks my heart when they get lumped in with the ones that are not doing the right thing. And isn't that so brilliant? And we have to be careful that we got to quit lumping things in, right? You know, there, listen, there, there are some pastors that aren't good pastors, but there's some pastors that are actually pretty good pastors. Come on now. I hope that was for me. <laughs> don't, don't lump me in with those, right? In fact, as a pastor, I, I, I want, I, I, I don't like those pastors that are abusing people doing things either. I mean, it, and so, so we have to understand, folks, that we have to make sure that we look at things the right way and not just, just, just putting all, just throwing out the net with everybody. And, and it's interesting because you're a three, you were a three-time felon, and, and you said, well, how many years ago, would you ever imagine you, were sit, you would be sitting on the platform with undersheriff, you know, Mc, Mc, Kevin, okay, <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is what the grace of God does. This is what God can do. Absolutely. I, this is a picture, folks, right here of what, what can actually happen. Right. Okay, this isn't, this isn't a, a, a uh, well, let, let's, let's make a hypothesis or let's, let's, make, let, let's just talk about what could be. No, this is what's happening right now. Yeah. And I think this is the way it's supposed to be. Um, as followers of Christ, as believers in Christ, you know, the Bible says that God had reconciled us to himself through Jesus and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. And this is what this is all about, reconciling relationships with other people, right? And I think that that's what the, if, if we can get that right across this country, that we are to be in relationship with each other, I think that you will see a lot of the issues that are taking place uh, in, in our community just go away. And this is why having conversations like this to promote, let's talk, let's, let's get to know somebody. Kevin, I, I want to throw it your way for a second because uh, I think it was John was telling me, what motivates you to become a police officer 20 some years ago? Um, you know, I don't know what is it, what, how many years have you been a police officer now? Yeah, I realize I need to give you a new bio, John. I actually just hit my 30th year on September 11th, so. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I was born in California, but I grew up in Colorado, and uh, my father was a uh, fireman for the Denver Fire Department, and so um, many of the uh, males in my family all served in the military at one point or another, so I really kind of had a uh, no choice but to move towards that line of service. And if the truth be known, uh, my dad and mom wanted me out of the house as quickly as they could get me out of the house because I was, I was either going to go become a criminal or a cop, one or the other, right? And kind of <laughs> right down the middle of that line. And so I had the fortune to join the United States Army in 1986 and served three years and, uh, and then uh, hired on at Metro at 22. And so you've been, and you came in and been, 30 years here in Las Vegas. Yep, I started at, at 22 years old here in Las Vegas, and uh, I've worked myself all the way through all the ranks. Um, I'm the highest non-elected uh, individual at Metro, and um, I have to tell you, though, the, the, as you talk about 
um, this sort of police and, and, and community piece of this. Um, John and I have known each other now for over a decade, and, and uh, these relationships don't start out easy, right? I mean, um, but where we start out is, is that we see each other as human beings first and foremost. That I don't see you as a black man and you see me as a white cop, that we see each other as human beings. And as long as we can take those first steps, we can actually so begin to, to move to that reconciliation that you so talk good. about so much. So good. Well said. Well said. Hey, Pastor Tony, we were talking in the back, and you have an incredible background, and now you're serving. And, and I read the bio, but some people don't understand what the czar you know, <laughs> you know, what, what that means and what does it entail? Can you just kind of maybe unwrap that a little bit for uh, people here and then online community? The first, the first step back where you and John met in D.C. was an initiative that was modeled after the state of Georgia. Some of the things that we did in Georgia were around prison reform, uh, getting returning citizens back on their feet. And that legislation that the president signed created a position called the executive director of the First Step Act, which oversees and work with all 17 federal agencies, Secretary Carson, Secretary DeBose, the Department of Labor, Health and Human Services, all those agencies, you work with those agencies to move the needle to help men like John and other folks who have been in our prisons make it back into our communities, as well as coming up with plans to keep children from coming into that pipeline into our prisons. And you work with all the states and you work with all the local municipalities and you work with all the prisons to try to come up with evidence-based practice models like Hope for Prisons that we can replicate across the nation. And so um, in March, uh, right before the pandemic, and actually in February, uh, the president uh, made the announcement he was gonna choose this, this pastor from Georgia who was already serving President Jimmy Carter at Maranatha Baptist Church was going to appoint him to be in charge of the, uh, this first step act, which the short version is reentry czar. And so um, I accepted that position. So I have the luxury of serving two presidents at the same time. Um, um, nobody, nobody does that but God. So all those that pick up that book called the Bible, every now and then God will throw you a curveball and you just got to sit your weight back on that curveball and wait till it break the right way and hit it. Good. So I want you to get a little bit of background, and we're going to uh, dive right in now, John, and I'm going to really uh, let you jump in and, and really start to lead because of what you've been doing, working with Kevin, working with Tony, Pastor Tony, and, and doing these roundtables or discussions across the country and the, cool, the great thing is, it's happening here. This is, this is the original kind of, you know, pilot program that I know even President Trump was coming to, to see. And I don't want to steer, but, but can you share what, what, what recently happened? Then you can jump into what we're going to jump into about. Man, God has been so good. There's been so many recent things. <laughs> you have to point me in the direction, though. <laughs> Which one are you referring to? Oh, you're referring to the total full pardon? Right? By the President of the United States. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, I have to tell you a quick story about, about the pardon because it was completely a, a surprise. And I had the privilege to have my wife there who's sitting out here. And we, and we were there and I was supposed to be speaking. And, um, and uh, when, you know, he said he was going to grant me the pardon, I was just very overwhelmed. Right, just very, very overwhelmed, and I think I dropped my head, and I was about to cry, and as I'm about to begin weeping, I heard God whisper to me that I pardoned you back in 2004, that prison cell, when you surrendered your life to my son. Right? You know, what President Trump did on August 24th was just him bringing this thing full circle, so... You know, very honored at the work that we have been doing and, you know, with the boots on the ground and serving the men and women who are coming home from the prison system to ensure 
that we're doing everything we possibly can to help them to be successful members in the community, taking their rightful position, number one, in their homes so they can impact their family, uh, back into the workplace, and ultimately for them to be stand-up leaders in the community. Uh, with an emphasis on them never, ever, ever reinvented again. So the success that we've had with Hope for Prisoners, uh, if you would have asked me many years ago uh, in 2009 when we first get, you know, got the ball up and running, you know, would, could you have imagined it being this successful to where other jurisdictions across the country are looking to replicate our model and have it exported? I couldn't even fathom that, you know, but, but, but God. So the work that, the work that we're doing uh, not only helping people to, you know, get acclimated back into workplaces in their home, but we need to help them to be stand-up leaders in the community. And we want to help men and women who are coming home and to never reoffend again, right? And in order for us to be able to do that, we have to instill some things on the inside here. Number one, that there is an integrity and, and moral character being built up on the inside. And then we have to make sure that they develop a love and appreciation for the rules and regulations inside our community. We found that that gets enhanced, here's his word again, when they are in relationship with the men and women who are upholding the law. And that level of partnership, again, could not even fathom the success of it right now because it's helping men and women who are returning back to, to our communities view law enforcement from a whole different perspective. And I think that in that relationship, they begin to see them not as the captains and the lieutenants and the, and the patrolmen. Life rubbing up against life, you get to see the husband, the father, the son, the daughter that's by, behind that badge. And if you think about it, across our nation, we turn on the news, we can see it all the time, and people are protesting and and, and historically, people do not trust police. It's like this natural thing, this innate thing. We don't trust police. But the reason why they don't trust police is because they're not in relationship with police. And in what relationship could you ever establish trust unless there's life rubbing up against life in the spirit of complete transparency? And understanding that we have more in common <laughs> than we have differences. It is out of that transparency, the relationship gets established. And out of that relationship is when you establish trust. And the men and women of the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department has done it above and beyond the call of duty, the best that I've ever seen. You know, when we travel across the country, we begin to share with other police departments what we're doing. They look at us like, man, you doing what? How in the world? What do you mean? You have formerly incarcerated people with police officers? Yeah, we do. You're in relationship with them. Right? And some of those relationships you have, we have the arresting officer who arrested a gang-affiliated person 17, 18 years ago. And that gang officer who may be a lieutenant right now, 16, 17 years ago, he was the boots on the ground gang task force who has taken that person in custody. And here it is 17 years later, life rubbing up against life. To this day, they're best friends. The officer, you know what the, the, the lieutenant tells me? That this person mentors him, <laughs> right? This person is mentoring him. But it's, it's all about, it's all about the relationships and the relationships are, are key. And I don't care uh, what sector you are in, in, in walking on this earth. God created us to be in relationship. Yes. And when we're not in relationship, there's a disconnect that just disrupts everything. And if I was the enemy, though I'm not the enemy, but some people think I'm the enemy. But if I was the enemy, I would fracture relationships because now we we're not talking we we I, I look at a uniform i don't look at a husband a son a daughter right and now and and i like what you said kevin we're we're, we're human beings we're, we're you know we're we're not first and foremost black or white but you know we we are part of humanity and i think that's what's missing is that we don't have the relationships because they're broken 
and, and families are broken. The relationship is broken. Pastor Benny, could you just make me, remind me of something when you, you talked about the enemy. Have you ever thought about how close that word enemy comes to the inner me? This is what we need to get all across the country. Think about how close the word enemy comes to the inner me. And listen, I spent a lifetime fighting enemies on the outside until I took a look at the enemies that were laying dormant on the inner me. And when Jesus helped me to conquer the enemies on the inner me, the enemies on the outside disappeared. That's when I had come to the understanding for John Ponder, it was never the police. It was always what was going on on the inner me. But the Bible says that when I was a child, yeah. I thought like a child, yeah. I acted like a child, and I did childish things. But then it says, when I became a man, yes. I put the childish things away and the enemies on the outside disappeared. This is why I can say the men and women behind those badges are some of the best friends that I have on this planet. Pastor Tony, can you jump in here? And, and you guys have been working together, known each other for a number of years. Well, I was going to sit down and get a piece of paper and write out his license so we can go and get him ordained today. <laughs> dropping, dropping nuggets like that. But, no, he's, John is absolutely right. Um, we have to deal with what's on the inside of us if we're really going to help our nation. Too many of us are fighting each other without talking to each other. If you look at all the riots and everything that are taking place, they are fighting and yelling at each other to a level where they can't even listen to each other. And then they start tearing down their communities. And then they wake up the next day and wonder, where am I going to buy milk for my baby girl? Because we were arguing and fighting, and now I burned down the place. What you're doing here in Vegas, when I was going to school back, back when, Vegas was known as Sin City. You want to commit sin, you come to Vegas. Here we are in 2020, and we have a program called Hope for Prisoners, where this program is leading the way for men and women who have sinned, and now you have an agency that house people for sin, and then men and women who know the gospel of Jesus Christ come along and help those who have been incarcerated for their sins. That's how it's supposed to be. If the government has a place where they house people for being a sinner, to me it just seems like those that know Jesus for himself, that's where we should be going and trying to help those who have sinned. So when you look at this whole prison reform thing, and we talk about this all the time about returning citizens, you can't walk with Christ without wanting to walk to the prison. Because John wrote Revelation while he was in prison, about to be headed. Joseph wrote, Joseph went to the palace while he was in the pit and then almost caught a rape case and went back into the pit and then came out of the pit and went to the palace. David should have been in prison for premeditated murder for a woman that he saw and had her husband killed. If you look at Paul and Silas all throughout the Bible, in and out of incarceration, they too were returning citizens. And it's Jesus that we preach about. He was a returning citizen after being convicted by religious folks and government folks and came out of the grave to give people pardons like John's <laughs> ponders. And that's why, that's why I'm excited about this whole criminal justice reform, First Step Act, trying to bring communities together and have this very valuable conversation. Because if we don't have this conversation, there will always be stigmas against people who have been incarcerated, who have had sin in their life. I grew up in North Philadelphia, one of the worst ghettos in America, but some of the greatest sports teams in America. Just always have a hard time winning championships. But anyway, 
in the, in the neighborhood, you know, a lot of people that I grew up with are either dead or in jail. Crime in those communities every day. And I went back there last week and I drove through my old neighborhood and nothing have changed. Same empty blocks, same vacant lots, same beer cans, same trash. I mean, just, just a terrible cycle. And I asked myself the question, where is the people of faith? And even when I see the riding on TV, I ask myself, where's the people of faith? Because we've gotten so good at sitting that we don't go out and share the gospel of Jesus Christ where we can have those relationships, where we can help those men and women who are coming out of prisons, where I can see that this here sheriff's heart is a servant leader who wants to serve, where I can see the fact that, yes, we have differences and things, bad things are going to happen, but one thing we understand more than anything, the Christ that we serve don't do funerals. He don't allow things to die on his watch. Lazarus, come out of the grave. The woman of issue blood who was dying, hey, get up, come on, I'm attracted to your faith. Someone made a demand on my ability. He don't allow things to die. That's why he said, I defeated death. And here we are dying around each other. How can the church sit around and read that little boys and little girls are being put in sex slave in their communities and do nothing about it? How can the church see that we have men and women shooting each other on the streets and do nothing about it? We, we're supposed to leave, and I, I'll shut up with this, that you might not get this, but it's in the Bible. The Bible says that government sits on his shoulder. So all these Christians sitting out there, got a little government sitting on your shoulder because you preach that he lives because he lives in me. So, but then we get these wedge issues that pulls us apart. And then we choose either the donkey or the elephant and not the lamb. I'm going to use that more often. But I'll share this with you, and I hope you can hold on to this, especially with those in the church. Jairus, religious man from the synagogue, went looking for Jesus because his daughter was on death's door. He gets Jesus, and they're walking together on his way to the house, and Jesus get interrupted, a wedge issue, by another situation with a woman with the issue of blood. And she grabs the hem of his garment, stops Jesus in his tracks, and J.R.'s problem got put on the back end because he was walking with Jesus, and Jesus stopped. Jesus healed this woman and said, because your faith that made you whole, and during that time, J.R. gets a message that says, don't bother bringing Jesus because your daughter has died. And Jesus, who don't do funerals, said, don't be afraid, only believe. So my question to you, when did we stop believing? <laughs> that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us from our communities to our prisons to our hospitals during a pandemic to every issue that have whenever there's an interruption in our communities in our life Jesus says don't be afraid only believe and we're hiding I get it the pandemic make you hide but remember there's always been a pandemic Moses had a pandemic when the snakes was biting people on it on their ankles and killing them Moses had a pandemic, but the vaccine was beat some brass into the very thing that's biting the people, lift it up, and if they look at it, they shall be made whole. Christ always given us the vaccine. Why are we hiding and afraid? Come on, five-second praise break. Come on, Church LV. You know what I'm talking about. We're a, we're a talkback church. Yes, we are. All right. 
You know, it, it, it is so, you, you bring up the wedge issues because the, the enemy is into division. Yes. The enemy is confusion. What does the Bible say? Where there's division, strife, envy, you know, that's not, that's not the spirit of Jesus. I hear people say, well, I'm standing up for righteousness, but you're not doing it in the spirit of Jesus. And I think the spirit of Jesus is as significant as what you're standing up for. And, and my heart, and as a pastor in this community, we've been pastoring. We started this church in our home with 27 people. 25 people we did not know. I was on a church staff. I, I, I didn't know very many people at all. And God called us to come to Las Vegas in 2001. And we started church in 2003. You would have told me 17 years later, look what God has done. Multiple campuses. You know, uh, every week this church is reaching with our care packs. Hundreds and hundreds of people every weekend are getting practical assistance, right, We're, with our youth. A big shout out to Pastor Stan Hicks, who goes and preaches into the jail and the prisons every week. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of, of and, and other chaplains are going in there. This, this, is, this is Jesus. This is Jesus. Jesus commands us and compels us to go out there. Pastor Tony said something in the back room, and I said, he says, if you're going to get attacked, but you won't get attacked if you're not doing nothing. And, and, and I just want to start doing more stuff. I'd rather be misunderstood for doing something than misunderstood for not doing anything. So, so, you know, because I hear the narratives and I have friends on both sides. I got attacked because I went to sit with President Trump just by sitting with the president. You, you got attacked too, right? And, and I am like, wow, I mean, just visceral stuff on social media. And I said, if President Obama would have invited me, I would have went to the White House. Right? It, it's, it's like, you can't have influence if you don't sit at the table. You can't have influence if you don't talk. And, and, and one of them was so, so I looked up on their social media, and right away, it's their political party that they're pushing. And I'm like, listen, we all have our opinions. But when I stand before Jesus... He's not going to ask my political party. He said, um, when I was in prison, did you go visit me? When I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was thirsty, did you give me something to drink? And, and well, Jesus, we never saw, because if we saw you, Jesus, we would have done it. Maybe the person we're vilifying is really Jesus. That we need to actually look at people differently. Even people that vehemently disagree with me. To say they're human beings first. And the pain and the hurt. Listen, John, people don't act crazy for no reason. It's the, it's the inner me. It's the pain of the heart that people do that. You know, I grew up in East L.A. Some of you thought I was Middle Eastern. Nothing wrong with that. But I'm Latino Hispanic. Hablo Espanol. Just saying, number one ethnic group in America, hey, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if I run for office, I'm going to win. No, um, but, but, but the issue in so many, at least where I grew up, was the fatherlessness. Yeah, yeah. There is no dad in the home. Yeah. So now you have a young man trying to become a man yeah. without the right role model. Because if you follow the wrong model, you're going to replicate the wrong model. And for the brokenness in the homes, this is where the church should be coming in. This is where mentors should be coming in. This is where we say, hey, listen, we want to come in. We want to help you. Talk, talk about that because I, 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 I'm sensing something. Biggest thing, when we, we have young men and, and young women who don't get a rise of passage into manhood and womanhood because of a broken family, a broken home, you're going to have scattered children who's trying to find their way. And the devil op operates in that space to go after those lives because the church don't come in and replace that fatherhood or that motherhood. 
He says, go ye there making disciples. And we saying, come disciples to the church. But we don't get the word go. And we got to get to the point of saying, I'm willing to go to the prisons. I'm willing to go to the hospitals. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to help our people. I think reason why we're so scattered right now that the church did not prepare for the next supper. We preach about the last supper, but we never help our communities get to the next supper. Here's the point why I say that. We have in my community, in your community, we have black and brown, the majority in our prisons. But it's not the majority of the people that are coming inside the prison to minister to them. White evangelicals, Christian fellowship, uh, prison fellowship, Kairos. Most of those religious leaders don't look like you or I. And so when you look at these communities that are breaking and falling apart, you say, where is the people that look like me? My first day on a job, because I was the, uh, I did reentry for the state of Georgia as well. My first day on that job, this 87-year-old white woman took me to this place called Phillips Prison. And she said, come on, Tony, you know, they're giving you a tour over there, but I want to show you that, that what they don't want is you to see. And she took me into this place where there was a hospice inside the prison. And there was this African-American man laying on a bed there, and he's making his transition between earth and the door. And he looks up to me. He said, how you doing, brother? And I said, hey, brother, how are you? And he, I said, is there anything I can do for you? He said, could you just get a pastor to come up and pray for me? It kicked me in the gut because the fact he was looking for that when he was trying to get to the door. Some of y'all will get that when you get to the door, but here he is making his transition and he's asking me to get him a pastor. And then I, I said, brother, well, well, let me pray for you because I'm a pastor. But it, it bothered me. It gave me this fire on the inside that we got to do whatever we can to get people inside the prisons and hospitals that don't want to come into the prisons just to cut their teeth, but to build a relationship with those men and women, the time they're incarcerated to make a transition back into the community, to deal with the stigma. When we do that, we change our communities for the best. Mm. And, and I like what you're saying because you, you have mentorship programs Absolutely. Yeah. with Hope for Prisoners. Yes. Let's talk about that because sure. I, I think... You may be watching online and you're here in Vegas. There's opportunities for you to actually be involved in seeing people's lives changed. Yeah. Absolutely. Let me, let me tell you the reason why that's so uh, important. Uh, and you look at the breakdown in the communities, right? People coming out of those communities just to break down their community. The one thing that we've learned, and I speak from my own personal experience, is that the, the vast majority of people, they really want to change. They have no idea how to do it. And for so long, we've been telling people from this segment of the population coming from those communities that, you know, to get out of prison and be a productive member of the community, and they have no idea what that looks like. Or we tell them to go get a job and, 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 and take care of themselves, and some of them have never worked a day before in their life. Or the big thing is, we tell males to come home and take their rightful positions in their home as fathers and sons and husbands and have no idea what that looks like. So it's important that we come along and we, we train people through mentorship to help them, train them up, to take their rightful positions in the home. And when the man, because he's the priest of the household, takes his rightful position in the home and raises up his children, then his home is going to impact the church. And then the church goes on and impacts the community. Then the community goes on and impacts the state. And this is how we see this magnificent transformation all over the country, but you cannot do it by, the, by yourselves. 
This is why that mentorship is so important. If you ask anybody who has ever achieved any significant level of success in life, how did you do it? How did you get to where you are? If they're honest with you, they're going to admit to you that they did not get there by themselves. Yeah. They had people that were in their lives that were guiding, directing, coaching, push, pulling, dragging every single step of the way. And this is why that partnership with law enforcement is so important. Do you not realize that the sheriff has given our organization just a little over a hundred men and women from the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department that serves as mentors? Listen, let me, let, me, let me show you how big the God is that we serve. Never before in the history of reentry, nowhere on this planet to this magnitude has law enforcement gotten this involved in mentoring and training men and women who are returning to communities all the way across our valley. And it's causing such a win-win on just both sides. I mean, I don't have time to unpack it, but listen, it's helping men and women view law enforcement from a whole different perspective. But you know what the big win is? It is helping law enforcement view people returning to the community who are really truly fighting for a second chance it's helping them to view them from a whole nother set of lenses. And when they see that, their heart has compassion to see what it is that they can do to help them not only not get arrested, but what can they do to help individuals coming back to the community begin to experience levels of life that most people only dream of. Yo, oh, Pastor, Sheriff, I came to a graduation and I watched the sheriff's heart. I watched his men and women heart. And then I heard a story, and I want the sheriff to elaborate on this story because it needs to be told. There was an officer there who I believe he was Jewish. And he arrested a woman who was on drugs. And during that time, she was pregnant. Pregnant with a little boy. She's had that baby. This arresting officer now, after she did her time, is now mentoring her and the boy. The same officer that put her in prison is now the same officer that is mentoring her. No place in the country. And that's why, you know, that old analogy, what happens in Vegas needs to stay in Vegas. No, 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 no. That's why we are amplifying everything well, no, God is amplifying everything that this man is doing here in Metro. Well, sir, if you can elaborate on that, that story a little bit. Um, you know, imagine being me, right? I get a, we've been doing this all over the country. I'm up here with two black pastors and Pastor Benny, and they can tell stories like nobody's business, right? It's just so... Amazing every time we do this, I get to learn something more from, from all of you, so thank you. But, you know, um, I do have to say, though, as you, go, you were going back to the attack, one of the things that I could certainly identify with is the attack, certainly today on the attack on law enforcement. And, you know, I have 6,000 men and women that work for me, and probably none of you go to bed at night knowing that hundreds of your men and women are out there in their 20s running around with guns and and confronting people who don't want to be taken into custody. It's something that keeps you awake all night, all day. Well, what I will tell you is, is that I know their hearts and I know their minds, and there's so much to talk about with this, but the truth is, is that we had policies that said we couldn't associate with persons of ill repute, we couldn't consort with persons of ill repute, and quite frankly, when John came to me, I, I really didn't want to, to partner with John because I'd seen program after program after program take money and do absolutely nothing with it. And so when we, we finally had done this, i I just tell you a real quick snippet on my own is for a long time I'd been involved with the black community in particular, and I happened to be the captain in West Las Vegas, Bolden Area Command at the time. And um, one of the things that I would say consistently to the community that when I would hear that we don't care was that, you know, in my 30 years now, I've stood at the scene of hundreds of people that have been murdered. And there's one commonality in every one of those murders, and that's that police always show up. We're always there, no matter what anybody has to say. But I moved very quickly into the next piece of this, where I'm a captain 
at Bolden and I'd stood over the body of 13 young dead black men. And the solve rate for homicide in West Las Vegas at that time was exactly zero. Um, it was true. We weren't getting what we needed. And so many people had so many reasons to describe why we couldn't do these things, why we couldn't solve it because the black community wouldn't talk to the police. There was no trust, no relationship. And I just wasn't going to accept that as, as part of the answer. And there's a lot of other stories here with it. But when you meet John and, and John comes in the room and he tells you what he wants you to do, and, and as we start to move this program forward, I have to be very candid with you that, um, well, first off, I always say that there still is a need for a prison ministry. Don't get me wrong when I say that to you. Some people still need to be incarcerated and, and still have their, their, their soul catered to while they're in, in prison. But the reality of it also is that we've done nothing for so long to, to these individuals that found themselves in a position, committed a crime, went to jail, served their time, came back, found themselves right back in the same position. Couldn't get an identification card, couldn't get a meaningful job, couldn't get any health insurance, couldn't do anything. And we are wondering why the same result was coming after the, every single time. And so our, our attempts really at the very beginning, you know, we, we were having trouble keeping the lights on at, at Hope and trying to figure this out. But when the idea came that we were going to ask police officers to be mentors to returning offenders, I thought I would spend a, a bit of my own capital. And I asked about 60 or 70 people that I had a lot of influence over to, to come in. And, and I, I asked them if they would be willing to do this. And I only got about six or seven takers at that time. Today, I have every rank of our organization, from myself on down to a patrol officer uh, that spent, they don't get paid for it. So when you hear that, don't, don't think that I'm giving them money to go do this. They're doing this because I know what happens with, with human beings in particular, but also with the men and women that take and, 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 and sacrifice enough to wear this uniform. And that simply is, if you capture them in the heart, the rest of it will follow. Yeah. And that is just so, so important as we move forward. And I, I'll just sort of wrap part of that up by simply saying to you, you know, we have this narrative out there in today's world about cops, right? And sometimes we're our own worst enemy. But I will tell you that for many years, the police have been the ones to have to, to deal with all the failures of the rest of society. In other words, mental health, right? The Clark County Detention Center is the single largest mental health facility in the state of Nevada, and that is not right, okay? Fatherless families, unemployment, underemployment. The list goes on and on and on. If you want to be honest, unemployment during the good times here was down to 4%. You go into black community, still over 30%. We don't have honest conversations about these things, these courageous conversations that you're talking about having in this church. But those are the real things that we have to do. And if, if, if I, as a law enforcement leader, can convince law enforcement officers to partner with a, a one part of a, of a community that most people said don't deserve to have that level of partnership, then we can work far beyond the walls of every church in this community and heal every one of those issues. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Sheriff, I, I think we're going we, you know, to we we ordain John, but then we're going to run you for governor. Yeah, we, 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 we wanted to, you know, to end this around 8 o'clock, but this is church, LV, you know that don't mean nothing, you know, when the Holy Ghost begins to flow. Woo! You, you, just, you just start, start running. This is why we have these conversations. I, I want you to hear under Sheriff's heart. I want you to see him as a human being, as a father, somebody who cares. Somebody who is asking his men and women to mentor, and they're not getting paid. They're doing it because they see it makes a difference in people's lives. If the narrative could be started when, when somebody starts bringing up, well, what about this? What about that? Well, those are some issues, but let's talk about also, have you heard what's happening with Metro? Have you heard about 100 mentors that are taking place? 
Have you heard about hope for prisoners and the recidivism rate? That is the lowest of its kind. Come on, in the nation in Las Vegas. Have you heard about churches jumping in the community and saying enough is enough? I think if we could keep having these conversations. And then my goal as a pastor and a leader, community leader, is to go from the conversation to go do something. Yeah. But you can't go do something until you have the conversation. Some of you right now, you're being prompted, maybe even online, that the Holy Spirit is saying, you need to become a mentor. Right. Yeah. You need to become a mentor to, to, to somebody from Hope for Prisoners. Do you need more mentors, John? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm sorry, let me put this back on. Absolutely. Yeah. And, 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 and money. And money. <laughs> and money. Hope for prisoners. You could write a check to Hope for Prisoners, right? Hope for Prisoners. You spell million, M-I-L-L-I-O-N. I know what you're doing. See, see, a lot of you are laughing, but I used to say that, and I remember I, I used to say thousand. How many were in the church when I... And, 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 a, and a person came to me and said, if you have enough faith to spell it, I have enough faith to write it. Ooh. My Lord. So I've been saying million. And another gentleman came to me and said, well, Pastor, here's your million dollar check. So let me say you spell billion. B-I-L-L-I-O-N. <laughs> Pastor, if, 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 if somebody wrote a billion dollar check to hope for prisoners, how would you feel? I'd feel excited because he'd give me 10% back to the church LV, and we would just keep moving forward in Jesus' name. It's called partnership. <laughs> I'm going to give it some last words, and then we'll wrap it up. And uh, I don't know who wants to start off, but um, uh, just, just maybe some final thoughts. And, um, and, and one other thing, you said you have some basketball program or something like that that, that, that Metro puts on for... for for youth or for kids, can, can, that, I thought I kind of heard that in the background. Yeah, so it's actually one of the things that we don't do very well, and that is that um, we, we have 10 different area commands. Uh, your church is in my jurisdiction. Uh, it's served by the Southeast Area Command. And so every one of those area commands is allowed to unpack community policing in the way that is best serving their neighborhood and their constituents. And so Things that, like in Northeast Las Vegas, that's predominantly Hispanic, may not necessarily work over in Southwest Las Vegas, which, which where you have a lot more Asians, right? And so they develop a lot of this programming around it. But we do have a lot of things like the Police Athletic League. We have 400 kids do boxing. We have soccer. We have we have started a Bolden uh, Little League baseball team. We just don't do a very good job of explaining that to the community because it's we just do it. Right? It's just one of those things. And so you also asked for, for last words, and I'll just take advantage and just simply say this is, you know, I, I worked this neighborhood for a long time, all the way over to Boulder Highway in the first 12 years of my career. And what I'll tell you is, is that I was joking with your pastor about this being an old Kmart, and my wife worked here when she was in high school. And the reality of it is, is you've done a magnificent job of transforming this into God's place. But I would also um, ask and challenge you as much as you can to look beyond the four walls of this great church and see how it is that you can help this community, not only entirely in Las Vegas, but start somewhere. And you have a lot of areas that are challenged immediately around your church, just as, just as any other church does. And so don't take such a giant step that you, you get sort of beat back down where you can't have some success. I know you do much of this work anyway, but take those small steps that you're going out and you're making that immediate difference so that you can grab everybody by the heart and continue to move forward because when we all know, when we all believe, we can achieve, right? We all know that, and so thank you very much for, for having me. Uh, I'm, I'm really impressed what you've done here, and, and I appreciate all of your time as well. Pastor, thank you so much for having this honest conversation. This is the conversation that the churches need to have all across the globe if we're really truly going to put Christ on display. I, I would say this, you know, we have 185,000 men and women in our prisons that are veterans. 
who one day are going to come home. But the question that we have to ask ourselves, how did our nation get to the point that men and women can go fight for old glory, serve two and three conflicts from Afghanistan to Iraq, you name it, they serve it, they do it, and come home and find themselves homeless on our streets, then addicted to drugs, and then in our prisons or sitting in a jail labeled as mental illness and we do nothing. How did we end up allowing so many of our future workforce in our prisons? In the church, we still clap our hands and we give Judah praise, but we don't give any faith work. How do we get to the point of elect the leaders who allowed stigma to stay on people like him? In 2000 and 15, we had 205,000 men in our federal prisons. Because of what Hope and Youth has done, because of the First Step Act signed by this president, because of all the things that we've done, we ha we're down 148,000 men and women in our prisons now. They are coming home, being reunited with their families. We're putting in all the soft services, 17,000 new volunteers coming inside the prisons, heating and air and welding and all those things, driver's license, social security card, birth certificate. We're doing it. And why I'm here in, in Vegas? To replicate and highlight what they're doing and hope for prisoners from Vegas. Yes. Yes. So tell somebody this when they come and give you a wedge issue about an RRD. Show them how the lamb works. <laughs> put him on display roll it off your tongue and tell them that I want to be a kingdom maker a kingdom person who changes the kingdom that's what we do I gotta stand for that one come on we're standing for the king his name is Jesus folks we're about kingdom we're about kingdom Are we going to ordain him tonight? We got yes. some oil. We're going to ordain him right now. And, and hands on you. John. How many people know that you guys have an absolute rock star of a pastor inside Woo! your church? Man, how, how, how courageous is it to be able to have conversations to this magnitude? You know, keeping the conversations raw and uncut, but speaking truth. You know, Pastor Benny, uh, I was reminded of something that Pastor Tony said, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of when that very first time that we were in the White House, and it was a bunch of pastors and bishops sitting around the table, and, 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 and people began to have conversations about this First Step Act. And then they started talking about all the things they needed to have in this and helping people coming home from prison and starting inside and everything like that. And when I first started listening to the conversations, I sat back and says, man, somebody's throwing a hook in here somewhere. <laughs> because everything that they were saying, listen, I'm in the vein of this. I live this every day. Everything that they're saying is the stuff that needs to be done. And at the end of that, we all prayed and evidence that those answered prayers, listen, everything we prayed about in that room today, we are living in the manifestation of that right now. We are living in the manifestation of that. So I'm just very excited to look for, you know, down the road, but you know, what, what can a church do? And I know your church does a, an amazing job and, and the people in the church that, that love Jesus. I remember about eight years ago, I'll tell you this quick story. There was a young man who moved out here from Tennessee. And by this time, I'm three or four years in the Hope for Prisoners, and I'm connecting the dots in the community and got people all over town. This young man came in and he said, um, you know, I'm stuck, just came from prison. I don't know what to do. And I told him to sit down in front of the desk and here I am, go to my resources. I pick up the phone and I start calling a good friend of mine who was over the Clark County Social Services, right? Because I'm thinking in my mind, I gotta give a food stamp, riddle system, don't worry, I'll take care. 
So I called and, you know, asked for his name. And his, his secretary says, he's on the call. I'll hold. I told the guy, wait. And as I'm sitting there on the phone, I clearly hear God say, hang up the phone. And I hung up the phone. But I know God is about to speak to me. So I said, oh, yeah, he's going to call me back. Would you step out in the lobby? And then I closed my door. And I started having this conversation with God. And God said to me, look at what you were about to do. You were sending this young man outside of the body of Christ for a resource that I have equipped the church for. And he said that there's a lot of great social services and agencies, like the Lord. but God said the only reason why they exist is because the church missed the mark. But I think that when all everyone comes together, everyone who is the believers in Christ, listen, when we all come together, listen, on one accord, come together on one accord, that's when we will experience across this nation a book of Acts experience. Because you remember when the, the disciples in the upper room, mm -hmm. the Bible says that yeah. they were all on one accord. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Meaning they, 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 they checked whatever was their agenda outside the door. Wow. And when they got on one accord, for the same purpose, it says the wind came through, the Holy Spirit hit them so hard, right, that the people, they started speaking in tongues and, right, and everybody's thinking, but can you imagine if we, as believers in Jesus Christ across the United States of America, can come together on one accord in the purpose of presenting the kingdom the Holy Spirit will blow through this nation and we will experience a revival like we have never seen before. And that's where the true healing will take place in our land. It's almost like you don't want to end the conversation. Maybe we have to do a part two uh, sometime in the future. Uh, my last words, when you look at the disciples of Jesus, Jesus chose some interesting people to follow him. He chose a zealot who hated the government, and he chose somebody who worked for the government and put him in the same dorm room. When you look at the disciples, we look at them, and sometimes we think they were like 12 godly men. I call them the dirty dozen. They were just like you, just like me, having their own issues. Like, I want to sit on your right hand, your left hand. They had power issues, power struggles, and yet Jesus worked with them. And the one thing that brought a zealot and a government worker together was Jesus. Jesus has to be the center of what we're about. Healing will come at the cross. Equality comes, come on somebody, at the cross. Okay, so there's neither Greek nor Jew male nor female. What does that mean? That means we're all the same in, in, in God's eyes. The hope for America lies in the church of Jesus Christ rising up, rising up in diversity, in unity, and saying, no, we have a, a better answer to all this stuff that's going on. And it starts with building relationship. It starts with having the tough conversations. It starts working with Democrats and Republicans, <laughs> having those conversations. And ultimately, my role as we were in the White House together, and without divulging too much information, but it's amazing when we prayed, John, in that room, that God came into that room. I don't think he came into the room because as a Republican or a Democrat, I think he came into that room because there were people that were calling upon his name. And let us be those people that call upon the name of Jesus. Whatever you're, I don't know if I'm in church and I, you know, my neighbor is saying, I'm not religious. I said, neither am I. Religion is bad. Mess you up. So what are you into? I said, I'm into Jesus. So I told the guy. 
That's what I told him just two days ago. He was just coming over to give me some gloves because he's a receiver for the Raiders or whatever. And, and, and I'm talking to him about Jesus. Don't just let it be in a church. God has you in your neighborhood to be a light. God has you at your job. Come on to be a light. There are people that are depressed everywhere with this pandemic, this COVID. Talk to people. Give them a word of encouragement. Let them know. Listen, I'm going through it too. Can I pray with you? I have, I have yet, when we do our outreach, I would say, where's Christian? How many of you do you think 90% of the people receive prayer now? Before the COVID, people would just come, that's good. Now, hundreds of people are lining up. Hey, can we pray for you? Yes. And they're crying as we're praying for them. And, and, and one lady in particular, she said, thank you. She goes, man, I thought I was coming for food, for necessities, but I came for my soul. And that woman's been coming back week in and week out for prayer. When is the church opening? We're open now. So I want to say a big thank you. Can we say a big thank you to our esteemed panel one more time? Come on, can we thank them? Come on, Pastor Tony flew in. He flew in, I think, from, from Atlanta, Georgia. Okay? So, and, and thank you, Under Sheriff. Thank you, John. Yes. You know what? We, we're going to get you more mentors, and uh, we love supporting your ministry. I think we need to up what we're giving to you. And who, who, who wouldn't agree with that? We should, if you go to our church, how many of you think we should give more to, to John Ponder? Keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. Okay? Uh, thank you for that check. Thank you for that check. Thank you. Thank you. We'll receive it afterwards in Jesus' name. Pastor, let's pray. <laughs> Father, we just thank you. Uh, my heart is full and overwhelmed. The need is so great. <sighs> we have five loaves and two fish. But when we put it in your hands, Jesus, you multiply. Lord, lay my hands on John. God, multiply even greater what he's doing with Hope for Prisoners. Multiply his finances for that ministry. I lay my hands on you, man. And I pray that you get double of the mentors you have right now. I pray in the name of Jesus that even during a pandemic, there's increase, increase in every way. Continued favor in in the government, continue favor on both sides of the aisle, continue favor that the name of Jesus would be glorified. I, I pray for you, under sheriff. I lay my hands on you, and I declare blessing upon you. Blessing upon your department. I pray for you. God give you wisdom. God give you insight. I pray that your department, Metro, we continue to build those relationships, those mentors that are mentoring people that they've even arrested now that they're mentors. Let that story, Lord God, be told. Father, I thank you for Pastor Tony. Thank you for what he's doing, God, as he's been appointed by this president. Father, I just thank you that you prepared him for such a time as this. Thank you for unprecedented favor, open doors, open opportunities. I speak healing to your physical body, strength to your soul, strength to your body. In the mighty name of Jesus. And Father, I just thank you for this church. Thank you for Church LV. Thank you, Lord God, that we will stand and continue to say, God, that we want to see people encounter Jesus and to see them come to new life in you. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus for online campus and right here at Green Valley. In Jesus' name, come on, everybody, say a big amen. Amen. Thank you for being a courageous conversation. We love you all. Thank you so much.